in the middle of a series called Supreme. And this Supreme series is about the GOAT, the greatest of all time, that being Jesus the Christ. And so in this series called Supreme, as we walk through this book of Colossians, and we're in this series, uh, what you find in the book of Colossians is two complementary pieces. And what you find is both belief about Jesus and behavior in response to that belief. So we got to talk about belief and we got to talk about behavior. And so as we're in this text today, you can find yourselves in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1. We're going to go down till about verse 11 if we make it through this morning. Amen. And uh, we're going to try to get through this thing. And so what we're in right now is the second uh, complement, the second supplement of this two-part, this paradox of both belief and behavior. We want to talk about behavior today. We want to talk about the fact that as a believer, it's not good enough for me to have good ideas about God. It's not good enough for me to just think good thoughts about God, but I actually have to put into practice that very theology, that very doctrine, that very understanding about who God is and who Christ is and the fact that he's seated on the throne. All of that stuff sounds good, but what does it do for you in your life? What does it do for you? We want to talk about that today. And, and I would say Brian did, uh, Pastor Brian did very well last week in talking to us and laying the foundation for us for this particular week. And the last couple of weeks, he's been talking about how do I find wisdom, the wisdom hidden in Christ. And what that means is how do I take what's up there, out there in the air, and how do I bring it down to earth so that I can get some practical things that I need to live day to day. Amen. And in terms of a sermon series that we had the opportunity to preach or part of the sermon that I preach about the greatest of all time, what I was reminding people of at that time is that it's just not good enough to believe. It's just not good enough to have orthodoxy, meaning right belief, but we must have a orthopraxy, meaning that our practice must match that doctrine. And so Paul, in this part of of Colossians in chapter 3, what he's talking about is, man, I know you got, I've been giving you some good theology. I've been giving you some good doctrine. I've been telling you about a supreme savior. I've been telling you about a preeminent one. I've been telling you about the greatest of all time. And now, how is that going to help you to move? So the title of my sermon today is, How to Get Mentally Redressed. How to Get Mentally Redressed. Redress, And for those that are taking notes, I, I got three points for you. You know I got three points in a poem. And uh, my three points are gospel mindset. Getting a gospel mindset. That's the first one. Then you got to throw away your old stuff. And thirdly, you got to get dressed for church. And I'll explain what that means. I got, got some good stuff coming up for y'all. But let's, let's read the passage. And then let's talk about it just a little bit. So... Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Go ahead, grab your Bible, your iPad, your iPhone, whatever you got. And Colossians 3, chapter 1, uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these You too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, Paul says, up in here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. 
How do we get mentally redressed, y'all? We got to start off with a gospel mindset. We have to start off with a gospel mindset. He starts off in, in verse 1. He says that if then you have been raised with Christ. In other words, Paul starts off this practical application piece with a big assumption. That big assumption is the, res- the truth of the resurrection. Paul is saying that Nothing I'm about to tell you in this practical piece, right? I'm about to give you some some how-tos, right? I'm about to give you some points. But none of it matters without the power of the resurrection. None of it matters without the power of the resurrection. I can give you all the how-tos on God's green earth, but if you're not empowered by the resurrection of Jesus, you can't get to do the how-to. So Paul says, I'm, I'm, I'm about to tell you something, but it matters that you, your position matters before I give you the practical. And Paul, throughout this book, has been laying the foundation of the gospel so that he can get to this point of telling the people how to do what you need to do. Listen, y'all. We're living in a, some chaotic times. And we all come to the church and go to God because we need something that we cannot find in ourselves. We need something more. We're we're trying to make our lives just a little bit better. We're trying to get to a place where I'm, I'm deficient and I know I need some sufficiency. But let me tell you, you cannot find that within yourself. Neither can you find that on the earth. That you have to start off with the position of resurrection. And that's what he's talking about here, right? As we connect this back to chapter 2, what you find in, 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 in at the end of chapter 2 is that you find that people are trying to come up with religious duties and, and asceticism and all of these religious ideas and practices in order to make themselves feel a little bit better about their situation. But Paul is saying what matters is not the duty. What matters is the fact that you already have been resurrected. What matters, as, as Pastor Brian taught us last week, is that Jesus stumped out of the tomb. He stumped out of the tomb with what you strapped on his back. That's what matters. Your position in Jesus is the thing that gets you to that place where you can do what you need to do in order to do what you need to do for God. What matters is the resurrection. Because our souls ache. Our souls are aching for something, longing for something, desiring something. Lord, I need some help. And what Paul says is, first you got to wake up and realize you're awake. First you got to get up and realize you're alive. First you have to open your eyes and and recognize that you've been resurrected by Jesus. Because if not, if this is not done in the power of the resurrection then what you'll try to do is wash yourself off with dirty rags of religion. You'll try to wash and clean yourself and go and clean yourself in dirty water of religious duties. I just got to go to church a little bit more. I just got to, you know, I just got to stop doing this. I just, I just got to get married. I just got to stop being married. I got to get divorced. Or I, you, you, like all of these earthly solutions to a spiritual problem. Because religious activity that is not founded on Jesus Christ is like trying to build a big old beautiful mansion on top of sand. There's no foundation. The resurrection is the place from which we jump off into the entirety of this message to talk about what we need to do. And look at what he says here in chapter 3, verse 1. He says, Set, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. So what he's saying to us is, is that our mentality or our psychology has to catch up with our Christology. Our psychology has to catch up with our Christology, meaning that Jesus has already positioned us and that we are connected to him in his position. But our psychology, our mentality has to catch up with where Jesus is. That's what he says. He says, set your minds. He says, set your minds. It, it, look at what it, go, go, go where to where it says, where, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. 
can I tell you, it's important that you recognize that Jesus is sitting. Now, I don't have time to get into all the details of, 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 of Jesus sitting as a, as a priest, but what it means is, is that he's finished his work and he's chilling. You know, I have, I have a couple of sons, and, and sometimes I'll be in the room and I'll be chilling, right? And so my sons run in the room and they say, Papa, are we chilling? I say, yeah, we chilling. And what I'm trying to get you to see is that Jesus is chilling, so you need to chill. That you somehow need to draw from, from the fact that he is positioned, but he's chilling. Jesus did not get up out of his seat in, re, in, in response to the chaos because it didn't shock him. But in fact, because Jesus is on chill, I'm on chill. Because Jesus is seated, I'm chilling. I'm cool. I, 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 I'm not going to overreact to anything that happens on this earth because I, have, I serve a king that's chilling. I serve a king that did not overly react to, to the coronavirus. He didn't over, overreact to justices. He didn't do none of that. He is seated on the throne, which means he is king, and he has everything in control. He's chilling. It doesn't mean that he's despondent. It doesn't mean that he's not empathetic. It doesn't mean that Jesus it doesn't care about what's going on, but he is not allowing for it to control you. So what does that, what do I, your psychology got to catch up with your Christology. The position of your mind has to be repositioned to be seated with Christ, chilling. It subsides all types of anxiety because my God is chilling, so I'm chilling. My king is chilling, so I'm chilling. I'm seated. I'm cool. I'm going to make it through because my mind is set where he is, not on what I'm seeing right now. Jesus is seated. Set your mind. The setting of the mind means to keep thinking on these things, to keep thinking about heavenly things, to keep thinking about things that are above. And it's something that Proverbs reminds us about, right? Proverbs 4.23, and it, and it tells us that, that we got we to gotta guard our, our minds. We got to guard our hearts, which in the Hebrew means mind. We have to guard our mind with all vigilance, Hebrews 4.23 says. For from it flow the springs of life. Let me ask you all a question. Does life look like, does your life look like how you want it to look? Are you who you want to be? Are you living up to the fullness of your potential in Christ? And if not, then I have to start with, what are you thinking about on a regular basis? Where's your head at? Because where your mind is, your mind goes before everything else, and then everything else sort of catches up to it. Where your mind is, there, the, the, that, that's where you'll end up. And Paul is teaching us to set our mind on things that are above. If you set your mind on everything that happened back, back there, you'll end up in depression. If you set your mind way too far forward in the future trying to figure everything out, you'll end up in anxiety. But if you elevate your mind, you end up in the place where you need to be. Things that are above. What are these things? What are these things that we're supposed to set our mind towards. What are these things? As a husband, it's not simply that I, I have to provide for my family, that's true. But even more than that, on a natural note, on a natural level, of me having to provide for my family in the earthly realm of everything that we got going on, got to go to work, got to buy groceries, got to pay bills, got to do this, got kids need clothes, all it is. As a husband, I often think, how am I preparing my wife for Jesus? As a father, I often think, how am I preparing my sons to meet Jesus? Our brains and our minds and our thought process has to be on heavenly things. If you're going to meditate, meditate about what it's going to be like in glory. If you're going to think about something, think about what your life is supposed to look like in Christ. 
if you're going to, to process and, and go through these, the, all of this thinking, then think about the word of God. Think about the word which is a mirror which shows you who you are versus who Christ wants you to be. We need a new mentality. And our psychology has to catch up with our Christology. Look at verse 2. He says, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Don't, don't settle for earthly solutions to a spiritual problem. If, if, if you go back into Colossians chapter 2, what you'll find is a lot of things. You'll find that Paul is telling them that, that Jesus is the one who you are supposed to be focused on. I know you want to feel religious. I know you want to get spiritual and all of that. It's cool, but listen up. You're looking for earthly solutions. What I'm telling you right now is that Jesus is preeminent. Jesus is supreme. And that reality is the reality that will lead you to a more spiritual life. There's no pill. There's no diet. There's no relationship outside of Jesus that can get you to that place outside of him. There's, nothing, there's none of that. Ain't no food or drink. You can't worship on a particular day versus not on a particular day. This is all what Paul talks about in Colossians chapter 2 as, as sort of forms of religion. He says in verse 23 of Colossians 2 that these have indeed an appearance of wisdom. They, they sound good. Y'all, y'all know these folk be on YouTube all day. Sounding good than a mug. Got more wisdom tips than how-tos than, than a little bit. But when we talk about wisdom here, we're talking about it being founded on the depths that is Jesus Christ. He said, these indeed, these these sort of religious rags, these false religious duties, these have an appearance of wisdom, self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body. People starving themselves, beating themselves, not getting all kind of crazy stuff. He says, but they are not, uh, they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Do you know what does stop the indulgence of the flesh? The resurrection. Think on these things. Don't settle for earthly solutions to spiritual problems. You can't drink your way out of it, smoke your way out of it, porn your way out of it. You can't sleep your way out of it. There's a spiritual problem that's solved in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's move on. Look at verses 3 and 4 of Colossians 3. He says, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. See, verses 3 and 4, they're, they're, a, they're a personal connection to his preeminent resurrection. It's telling you once again that not only did Jesus rise from the dead, not only did Jesus stump out of the grave, but he came out and dragged you out with him. That matters. Because I'm not just celebrating some some idealistic idea of of resurrection of a man that I haven't yet uh, met in physical yet, but, but, but I'm talking about a man who brung me out of the grave with him. I'm talking about a king who died and was resurrected and brought me with him. And my life is hid with his life. My psychology better catch up to my Christology. Because my position is different than it was. I couldn't get myself out of that grave. I couldn't couldn't deal with my own sin. I couldn't pay the penalty for my own sin against God. But Jesus rose up out of the grave and brought me with him. Here's the problem, y'all. Let me just be real. The problem is, as we think about how to get dressed and redressed mentally, the problem is is that we were resurrected with grave clothes on. The problem is, is that you and I, we were resurrected in grave clothes. What do I mean by grave clothes? That old, dirty, dingy stuff that we were wearing in death is what we're resurrected wearing. And the process of sanctification is to get these old garments off of us and to put on something new. So my, second, my first point was, you got to get a gospel mindset. And my second point is, 
we got to throw away that old stuff. You know, my, my wife is at home probably, not right now because she's probably watching. God bless you, babe. Um, but this past weekend, she has been, um, I guess, spring cleaning, but it's summertime, so she's a little late. It's okay. But she's been cleaning out the closet at the, at the house. And what she's been doing is she's been get, getting rid of some old stuff. And the problem is that she wants to get rid of my stuff first. While I'm not there. I'm, listen, y'all, I'm, I'm at the church trying to prepare a sermon, and she's throwing away my clothes, y'all. <laughs> but what she's saying is, which is wise, what she's saying is, I see you buying some new clothes. The problem is you keep holding on to that old stuff. She says, you, you, can't put new old, you can't put new clothes on top of old clothes. Because guess what? Them old clothes, my, now my wife, is, she, she can be a little funny sometimes. She's showing me that, you know, them white shirts, they got the yellow stain up under them. And she's saying, you're trying to buy some new stuff and put some new stuff on top of some old stuff. But the problem is, is that I got to clear this old stuff out in order to get some new stuff in. Is y'all with me? Okay, so listen up. Paul is saying... That a part of this process of, of being sanctified, of being spiritually renewed, of, of getting redressed and getting your mind redressed, you got to put some old stuff away. So look, look at what he says in, in verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual morality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Get rid of that. Get rid of that, Christian. A part of your process, a part of the reason why you came is I didn't just resurrect you so you can wear some old funky clothes. I resurrected you so that you can put on a new garment and walk around in that cemetery that I raised you in as a resurrected son and daughter of Jesus. Get rid of that old stuff. All kind of stuff. Sexual morality, which covers everything from adultery to homosexuality to, and, and, and in case you didn't think that it was covered in the word sexual morality, he says impurity. Pornography, listen y'all, we are living at at least phase two or three of a sexual revolution in this country. We can't even, we're not even supposed to talk about homosexuality as a sin no more. We're not even supposed to mention that people are deciding, you know what man, we just, we just, we're not going to get married, we just, we're just going to live here together and, and, and live in this entanglement. <laughs> we, have married, we have celebrity married couples that are saying, now we're not technically married, we're just life partners. And even if you go over your side of the house over there with whoever you want to be with, and I go over here with whoever I want to be with, and that's just, that's just, we're entangled. We live in some wild times, y'all. And what Paul is saying is that you got to get rid of that stuff. That's why it's important to set your mind first. Because the part of setting of the mind is to say, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think how you want me to think. I'm going to do how you want me to do. I'm going to think your thoughts. I'm going to put my mind in a place where Jesus is. And I'm not going to sit here and try to figure my life out on my own, based on my own rules, and come up with, man, you know what? Everything seems right to me. That's a problem. Sexual morality. Impurity, passion, which is lust, evil desire, covetousness, which he says is idolatry. We live in a society where covetousness and idolatry is rampant as the world is opened up to us. As we scroll through Instagram, which is nothing but people's highlight reels of life, and we desire what other people have without being able to be grateful for what we got. We live in a society of envy, of covetousness. Paul says it's nothing but idolatry. These passions that you have for these earthly things are passions that were originally meant for your pursuit of God. Not your desirous, lustful intention to desire what somebody else has. And can I tell you that in many ways we are crippled by what other people think of us? 
Instead of having our mind set on what God wants for us, we're worried about the opinions of others and not the judgment of God. It's idolatry. It's the worship of another God. That you desire something more than to be with Christ. Here's the problem. The problem with my wife was is right in many ways to get rid of some old stuff. Matter of fact, I, last night I asked her like, "What did you throw away?" Because I didn't even see it. And, and um, she was like, "Boy, <laughs> that stuff don't fit you." And she was right. It doesn't fit me anymore. I'm a little bit thicker than I used to be. Here's the problem. The problem is we get comfortable with those old clothes. The problem is we get comfortable with those old habits. The problem is that we get comfortable with our sin. I had some shorts that I've had since the eighth grade. My wife threw them away because they had holes in places where you didn't want to see stuff. And she was right to do it, but I was comfortable. We get comfortable in our sin, which is the reason why it's hard for us to throw them away. Not only that, but some of us are walking around in generational hand-me-downs. Some of us are walking around in the sins of our fathers and the sins of our mothers. Some of us, our, our parents handed us these clothes and, and, and we wore them because our daddy wore them. Or we wear them because our mama wore them. These were the sins of my parents and generational hand-me-downs. And can I say this, and I mean this with all my heart. If you're not careful, you will hand these sinful things, this old stuff, down to your children. Throw it away. Throw your sin in the trash. There's no value to it. Don't even give it to goodwill. There's no value. Nobody wants that. Nobody needs that. Throw your sins in the trash. Sins of covetousness. Sins of sexual morality. Impurity. Sins of evil passions. These are, what, what are we talking about? We're talking about a mindset. We're not talking about just what you do. We're talking about how you think. We're talking about how we think. Not just what we do. And can I say this? You can do this. You can do this. I am, I, let me get, can I, do I have permission to talk about a pet peeve? Might get me in a little bit of trouble. I am so tired of Quasimodo Christians. I'm sick of it. It's a pet peeve. What do I mean by Quasimodo Christian? Just walking around dumpy. Like you can't do nothing. Just always, oh, my, the, broke, my, I'm, the broken, I'm broken, I'm broken. Listen, but Christ is supposed to come to fix you. What happened to the fact that Christ gave you everything pertaining to life and godliness? Walk around with your back straight a little bit. Walk around like a saint. I, I got sins too, I know. But let's walk around like somebody died for us. Let's walk around like somebody gave us the Holy Ghost, put it inside of us so we can walk around with a little bit more confidence. Let's walk around like, like we got some faith in somebody. Listen, I might not be nobody. Listen, listen, listen. I might not be nobody. I'm just a nappy-headed little boy from Buffalo, but I know somebody who is somebody. And he died on my behalf. Let's walk around like we got a little bit of something going on. Walk around sad and depressed all the time. Listen, if you struggle with depression, this is not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I am not criticizing. What I'm telling you is I am encouraging you to say that Christ has resurrected you. Stop walking around defeated like victims. We victors. Not because we do anything, but because we get associated with the king. Let's walk around like somebody died on our behalf. Let's walk around like we have a father who planned our good fortune from eternity past. Let's walk around like the spirit came to live in us. Let's walk around like we got the greatest book ever known to mankind. Let's walk around like we got a high priest who intercedes for our behalf. Let's walk around like we somebody. I'm, listen, what I'm telling you right now, you say, E, that's a little cocky. I'm talking about confidence by association. I'm talking about boasting in Christ. You see, when I preach greatest of all time, 
one of the things that I wish I would have mentioned was that the team members of Michael Jordan walked out on the court with confidence whether they could play the game or not because they knew whose team they were on. And what I'm telling you, Christian, is to develop a confidence by association. There's nothing good in me. I'm just a little nappy head boy from literally what they call the low. But I know somebody who is somebody. And he is my God. He is my king. I, I get to walk with him. I get to talk to him. I get to, I get to serve him. I get to love him. I get to confidence by association. You're not defeated. You're not defeated. You say, you say E, man, that sounds a little crazy. I ain't, I ain't never quite heard nothing like that. Um, well, let me prove it to you. Go to, if, you go, if you ran to Romans 6.15, it says this. He said, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law but under grace by no means? He says, but he says, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or, or of disobedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin and have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were commanded and having been set free from sin... And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. So now, now, believer, now that you done woke up, now that you done been resurrected, now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. But what? fruit were you getting at that time from the things in which you are now ashamed? For the end of that stuff is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. Set free. 2 Peter 1, 2 and 3 says, May the grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Here's the thing. What do you do? What do you do, believer? When your sins are the very things that have helped you survive. What do you do when you go back into the book of Colossians and it tells you that you must put off or put away anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk? What do you do, Christian, when it was the very sin that you had that helped you to survive the season where you felt like God wasn't with you? What do you do when it is your sexual morality that has helped you, you think, to deal in the bitterness towards your wife? What do you do when it is your anger that has protected you from what somebody did to you when you were a very little child? What do you do when it is your sin that you think has helped you survive up until this point? It's like a father who adopts a bunch of street children. And he brings them, all of these street children, into the house. And these kids are scrappy kids. And that father brings these children into this house and that child has a backpack full of guns, knives, whatever weapons they could find in their backpack. And these guns, these knives, these tools, these rugged clothes that these children have on, that father says, you're in my house now. You're in my house now. Take that off. But he's He goes to grab the backpack and the child says, no, this is my protection, my anger, my sexual morality. I know you call it sin, but it's kept me. It's helped me up until this point. And and, and the father says, nah, you don't need that here. Take it off. I know you think it's helped you survive out there in the streets, but that doesn't go here. 
You need new clothes. No, I've slept in these clothes. I've been in these clothes since for years. I, I've been on the streets with these clothes. I've been homeless with these clothes. I've been, my, 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 you don't know what my father did to me. My, my, my earthly father, you don't know what my mother did to me. I, I've survived in this space because of my sins. And Jesus looks at us and says, no, take all of that off. And the only reason why we hand Jesus our sin and, and our debt and our payments for that debt is because we trust him. We trust him that he's going to care for us while we're in this house called the church. That's why it's important to point out that your outfit is not just for you. That as you think about getting redressed, it's not just for you. But look at what it says here. He says, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. The last point that I want to make is that everybody in this house has now to put on a kingdom jersey. It's not that there aren't any Greeks and Jews in this house. It aren't, it's not that there aren't any Caribbeans and blacks and whites and Latinos in this house. It's that those things don't become your distinctions by which you make a difference one between the other. When I was growing up back in the day, and if you grew up in a house that was what we call somewhat of a blended family or, or you and your sister had a different dad, Back in the day, it would tell us, we don't talk about daddies here because y'all all came out the same place, if you know what I mean. And as believers, I'm begging us that in this season, as everything gets politicized, stop, stop identifying with your political party. Tell me, you can say, I vote as this or I vote as that, but don't tell me that. Don't tell me you are something that is not contingent upon your identity in Christ whether that's racially, ethnically, nationally, politically. Paul says up in here, Christ is all and in all. And that when you see the difference, it's to add to the magnificence and the glory of Jesus, not to make a difference between your brother or your sister. Let's pray. Father, we need to get mentally redressed. We need you to redress our minds. We need you to redress our spirit. We need you to redress us. Because we come into this house, Lord, as broken children, trying to survive the streets, trying to survive our life. And often we have used sins as our comfort. And we are asking that you, through the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the gospel, the fact that Christ died on my behalf and was resurrected for me, may that change my mind. Lord, I need a renewed mind. I need my psychology to catch up to your Christology. I need to stop holding on to my sin as comfort. And I need to stop holding on to my sin for survival. I just need to let it go and trust that you're going to take care of me. Lord, I need to trust that you got me. I just need to trust that you got me. But we give it all to you. In Christ's name. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor E, for that amazing reminder. Jesus is the greatest of all time. If you've been blessed by this message, we want you to take a moment to partner with us in giving. We truly could not do this without each of you and your support. Please visit our website at 954church.com slash give. Also, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Adam, take it away. Church, in response to the reading of God's word, let's give thanks to him this morning. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. 
Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Church, we receive this blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God bless you, Riverside Church. We'll see you next week.